Amen. Hey, so let me recap where we've been. Uh, first night in the class, I told you that our focus verse for this class, the power of a transformed mind, is Romans 12, 1 through 2. It says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your body of living sacrifices, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. You have conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you have to test and approve God's God's will as His good, pleasing, and perfect will. So this entire class, the foundation is this. God wants us to be renewed by the transformation of our mind. God wants us to be renewed in His way in a mind like Christ. And because of that, right, we can grow, we can see His holy and perfect will. We, when we talk about what are some of the foundations of a transformed mind. If you've been right, gave four foundations of a transformed mind. Four qualities that we need for a transformed mind. Uh, it's trust. Right? We need to trust God to have a transformed mind. We talked about humility. That, hey, we got to realize that I don't have all of the answers. That God has the answers. We talked about discipline. That to renew your mind is a repeat process. Over and over again, it's discipline. And fourthly, we talked about you need to have a childlike faith. That the fourth foundation principle is a childlike faith, meaning I need to have this young, right, faith that believes in what God can do for my life. That was week one. Week two, we looked at the, the a thought process, right? That thought process is everything that's conscious in our minds. And our thought process has four different parts. Week two, we looked at the first part is our, our mind has a thing called ideas. And we all have this thing called ideas and idea systems. And God wants us to transform our ideas to be more like His ideas. And our past, our backgrounds, our society, our culture affects our ideas. And either ideas are, are from God and His Word or our ideas are from the world. We looked, week three, last week, we looked at another part of our mind and that's images. We looked at what does it mean to have a healthy image of God? What does it mean to have a healthy image of ourselves? And we can't be transformed in our mind unless our, if our images aren't proper. That we have a healthy image of God and a healthy image of ourselves. So the, the four aspects of thought process is number one, it's ideas. Number two, it's images. But there's a third part of our thought line that we're going to talk about tonight. And that third part is called information. Information. And today, I got your title right on your page. So I just screw that up. So tonight, we get a transformation of information. Information is key. Information is critical. When I had you do your puzzles, your task was to put a puzzle together so you can see a picture. So you can see the complete picture. But you couldn't get it done because you didn't have information. Even though this wasn't a serious thing of life and death, and, and this wasn't a serious thing where you had to get done, but I can say that some of you were a little bit frustrated that you didn't have all the puzzle pieces, and you're a little bit sure that you didn't have all the correct information. See, without correct information, our ability to think has nothing to work on. Without the proper information, we can be afraid to think of things, or we can be incapable of thinking straight. A lack of information results in unpleasant burdens, and tragedies to the entire range of human life. When you don't have the information you need, right, it frustrates you. If, if you're a, a student, right, whether you're high school, college, PhD, and you're studying, you don't have, and you can't find the information in the library or the internet, that is frustrating. When you have a job and you're given a task, and you're told to do something, but then your your job or your boss or your supervisor doesn't give you all the information that you need to do to get your job. What happens? You get frustrated because you can't complete things. See, information can lead to frustration. Can, can lead to non-frustration. If you have a lack of information, it can lead to frustrations. Let me give you a story. Do you, there's a guy. He was a Hungarian doctor named Ignaz. Simon 
Michael Weiss. Ignaz Samuel Weiss. Anybody know who he is? Anybody want to know? Anybody want to know who he is? All right. Yeah. So he possibly saved all of our lives just through information. I'm going to tell you how. 1846, he was a Hungarian doctor, right? And he was looking at these numbers of women who gave birth dying. He discovered that women in the clinic, in the hospital, staffed by doctors and medical students, died at a rate nearly five times higher than women in the midwives' clinic. Right? So you have two ways of people you can birth, right? You have one in the, in the hospital and the clinic by doctors and medical students. And then you have another section of people who birth with midwives. And it's in 1846. And the, the, the people, the women in the clinic and hospital were dying at a rate of five times more. Other studies of this, of this uh, doctor say that they were dying to 10 to 20 times more, depending how you read it. But we'll go with five times, which is still a lot. So he decided to test out different theories. Wait, wait, so what are they doing? What are they doing? And, and he tried various things, and, and he tried multiple th attempts to figure out why these women in childbirth were dying. Okay? And here's what he found, okay? He found that the students and the doctors, <coughs> right, were dealing with cadavers, and they're getting hands dirty from dead corpse. Okay? And when they delivered the babies, these particles would be inside the women who would develop the disease, and guess what? Die! But the, the people in the Midwest clinics weren't dealing with dead bodies or cadavers, and their hands were cleaner, so the women were dying at a less rate. And this was called child bed fever. So what did he do? He ordered the medical staff to start cleaning their hands and instruments, with not just with soap, but with the chlorine solution. And what happened is, he, the childbirth deaths of these women so that drastically declined. And he, from there on, people started slowly, slowly, washing their hands. Before this, doctors were washing their hands when they were from patient to patient. And actually, he was criticized by doctors who said he was crazy. He wants to wash her hands with, with, with soap and chlorine, and he got actually a lot of flack and criticism from the medical community. But it was his, his research and his pushing that allowed doctors to say, hey, you know what? I think it'd be a good idea to wash my hands when I'm dealing with a dead person to women who are giving birth. But what happened? He gave information. See, the key information that he presented, that he found, saved lives. Not only then, but it still saves lives today. In your Christian life, in your Christian walk, right, you need information. Okay? You need information of what God desires from you, what God wants of your life. See, failure to know what God is really like and what His law requires, it destroys the soul. It ruins society. It leads people to eternal ruin. It, dis it causes disruption in our heart. If we don't know what God is really like and what He really desires out of us, it leads us to ruin. We need to know Right? What God wants. We need to know the parameters God has for our lives. But this is the tragic condition of our society today and our culture. Right? That God has given us information. God has made information available to us. But sometimes we don't apply that information. And what we're going to get a key part of our mind, a key part of our transformed mind is information. How are we getting our information, and what are we doing with our information? When we talk about Jesus, Jesus was a champion of information. I'm on the bottom of page one of your notes. Jesus was a champion of information. We have your Bible show with Luke chapter 4, please. Luke 4. God's all about giving us information. If you go through the Old Testament, and we look at the prophets, 
Jeremiah, Isaiah, Ezekiel, Hosea, Amos. The prophets talked about proclaiming to people, giving people the information they need to live. And God put the prophets in place in the Old Testament to give the people the information they needed to follow God. What happened is a lot of people didn't follow after the prophets and turned away from God. Luke 4. This is Jesus' mission statement, per se. This is what he says. This is Jesus starting out his ministry, beginning his earthly ministry, and kind of proclaiming people, right, this is who I am, this is what I'm going to do. Luke 4, 18-21 says this. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free. To proclaim the year of the Lord's favor, then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue was fastened to him. He began by saying to them, Today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. So what is Jesus saying? God sent Jesus to this earth to proclaim, right? to tell the information about what? The good news of the kingdom. Right? And it said that he is to proclaim freedom. Right? To communicate. To give information to you that there is freedom for the prisoners. <laughs> And to what? To proclaim, right, the year of the Lord's favor. Proclaiming meaning to tell, to communicate, to give information. See, Jesus' primary task, right, as the ultimate prophet and his end savior, is to give the people information on who he was as savior and who what, what living in God's kingdom really meant. And then to make disciples who in turn right, would take the information that Jesus proclaimed and spread the gospel all over the world. Which is why all of us are standing here today. Because the apostles, disciples, heard the information and they in turn took that information elsewhere. And the love of Jesus and the gospel is spread to us today. Matthew chapter 4. In the book of the Bible to Matthew 4. Matthew 4 says this. Jesus went throughout Galilee teaching information in their synagogues, proclaiming information, the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness among the people. News about him, information, spread all over Syria. And people brought to him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, even possessed, those having seizures, and they paralyzed, and, they, and he healed them. Large crowds from Galilee, the Catholic, Jerusalem, Judea, and the region of across the Jordan followed him. So Jesus, his mission is, I want to proclaim the good news of Jesus, the good news of God. And he's, he's proclaiming, he's teaching the synagogue, giving information, he's proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and because of this good information, the good news, what's happening? Is spreading. Diseases are being healed. Sickness is being healed. News about the good news is being spread. Those with pain, those being demon possessed, those being uh, seizures are being paralyzed. Jesus healed them. Why? Because his mission was to proclaim the Lord's favor, to give information to those who need it. Matthew 9. Verse 35 to 38. Matthew 9, verse 35 to 38. Remember, we talked about this a few weeks ago. 
the culture, especially the Jewish people, they had an image or an idea of what the Messiah would be. They had they had a mindset of this is how I do, this is how we think the Messiah is going to come. And they had a mindset about this is how religion should be. This is how we should live our lives. And Jesus had to come on this earth to tell people he was the Savior, was the Messiah, and to explain to people information of what it meant to follow after God. Matthew 9, verse 35 to 38 says this. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching, right? And they said it's going to proclaim the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowd, he had compassion on them because they are harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to the disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers to this harvest field. Jesus was teaching in synagogues, proclaiming the good news, giving information. The things were happening, good things were happening, but then, he also said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Meaning, I need help, I need assistance in getting this good information, this good news, out to those around us. See, Jesus wanted to proclaim the truth, to proclaim the kingdom of God and his presence to help people and how to interact with each other. Turn to page two. So the question we need to give ourselves is this. What does it mean to be transformed through information? We talked about the four, the four aspects of thought life. We talked about first ideas, number one. We talked about images. These are all these are all components of our thought life. We also are touching on information. How are we transformed through information? So we have eight sort of sections here, eight points to get through tonight. Uh, we're going to read each section. So I want us to turn to Romans one, verse eighteen and twenty. Romans one, verse eighteen and twenty. And what I'll do is I'll get volunteers to read um, each section as soon as everyone's gotten there. So. Um, hold off on volunteering. We'll, let's wait till everyone gets there, and then we'll. I'll ask the volunteer to read this section. All right, can I get a volunteer to, to read the next about? Ron, go ahead. Next about. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against the all godlessness and wickedness of men who suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them. Because God has made a way to them. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, His eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without an excuse. This great verse talks about the wrath of God, right? On people, because why? God has made it known to them who He is. So number one is this, God is constantly revealing himself, information to us. God is constantly revealing information to us. It says this, that God has made it plain to them, right? For since the creation of the world, God's qualities, right? So it's the beginning of time, since the beginning of this world, the beginning of creation, God's qualities, his power and his divine nature have been what? Clearly seen, clearly made known to us, so why? People are without excuse. God is constantly revealing information to us. The Bible is very clear, right, that, that Psalm 19, 1, the heavens proclaim, right, your name. The heavens and the sky proclaim your name. God is the one who communicates with people. See, I love that about God, that, that God is not stagnant, that, that God is not just sitting up there from afar, but God is constantly communicating to us, constantly talking to us. And, and why? Because He wants to give us information, right? He, God wants to tell us, you know what? You are loved. You are my beloved son, my beloved daughter. You are part of my kingdom. You are important. 
when God's sunrise comes up, communicates its beauty to us. Right? When the rainbow comes up, think about the promises of God. God is constantly revealing information to us. Number two, Romans 16, 25 to 27. Romans 16, 25 to 27. Okay. Now to him who is able to establish you in accordance with your gospel, the message I proclaim about Jesus Christ, in keeping with the revelation of the mystery, hidden for long age, ages past, but now revealed and made known through the prophetic, written by the command of the eternal God, so that all of the Gentiles might come to the Lord's that comes from faith. To the only wise God, be glory forever to Jesus Christ. Amen. So, Paul, who wrote Romans, says, It has now been revealed and made known to you by the command of the eternal God. So they may come in faith. So, what Paul is saying is, it is known to you what you need <coughs> to know. The number two is this. God has given us the information we need in life. God has given us information we need in life. God has, it says in the Bible, right, that God has given us information in life. So we can be obedient and come to faith through Jesus Christ. That is no longer, it's not hidden from you, no longer, it's no longer uh, a mystery what you need to do. That God has revealed information that we need in life to get through what we need to do and to be able to believe in Him, obey Him, and come to a saving faith. Number three. Philippians 1, 9-11. Philippians 1, which is 9-11. Philippians 1, 9-11. Amen. We'll wait till everyone gets there, and then I'll... Uh, Volunteer to read. Can I get a volunteer to read, please? Yep, Daryl. This is my prayer. That your love may abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight, so that you may be able to discern what is best, may be pure and blameless until the day of Christ, filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, the glory and praise of God. Paul uh, often writes very good prayers in his epistles. And uh, on a side note, if you ever need good scripture to pray for people, right, just take any of Paul's letters and epistles, turn to end of some chapters, the end of his, of his letters, great uh, uh, prayers just to pray over people. Very powerful prayer. So here's what Paul's saying. Right? That here's what he, he goes, my prayer for the church of Philippi and also for us is that your love abound more and more in knowledge and depth of insight so we can be discerned, right? So number three is this. Constantly pursuing information will expand our love and discernment. Constantly pursuing information will expand our love and discernment. So what is it saying here? It's saying that we need to grow more and more in knowledge and depth and insight. Paul is asking us, I pray that, that, that in your life you are growing more and more every day. That I'm growing more in depth of insight, not just for my own benefit, so my love can expand, so my eyes can be open to what God's love is, so I can... So I, so I can have about the God wants me to have, and also to have the discernment, right? Discernment is, is insight, is understanding, so I can have the discernment of what is best. Think about it. So you can discern what is best. You, you, you ever have moments in your life where, where you need to know what's the best 
thing to say to somebody? Or what's the best way to love somebody? Or what's the best way to show compassion? Or what's the best way for me to serve God? You know, Paul's saying is, my prayer is that you expand your knowledge and your insight, your information. Why? So that your love can abound. And if our love is abounding, we can also discern what is pure and blameless what God wants us to do. God wants you to constantly pursue information through Him to expand our love and discernment. Number four, we look at Psalms 119, verse 33 and 35. Psalms 119, verse 33 to 35. I'm going to do volunteer to read. Tim. Teach me, Lord, the way of your decrees, so that I may follow it to the end. Give me understanding, so that I may keep your law and obey it with all my heart. Direct me to the path of your commands, for there I find the way. The psalmist says to God, his prayer is to what? Teach me. Teach me, God. Teach me, God. Give me information. Number four is this, the prayers of our heart should be to ask God for more information. Do you, do we constantly have that prayer? Do we ask God, God, teach me, God, show me, so that I may follow your ways, right? So, some of us, right, we're scared to ask God for insight, because we're afraid that it may ask require us to change a part of our life. Right? Some of us are afraid to go into the scripture and to ask God to reveal himself to us because it might require us to change aspects of who we are. The psalmist says, Give me what? Understanding. Give me information. So that I may keep your law and obey with all your heart. The prayer. Right? But David's heart is, I want to know understanding. I want to know information. So I could obey your word. Right? All my heart. How many of us, is that, that's our prayer in the morning, where we're asking God to tell us what we need to do right. We're asking God to tell us what his commands are and his laws are. We're asking God to tell us, how do you want me to live my life? I want to obey you. And David is saying, direct me, show me, like, give me information, for there I find the light. I find the light. Whenever we talked about a lack of information creates frustration, creates chaos, creates inner turmoil, right? But proper information gives life. We talked about we talked about on a practical level from the puzzles to this uh, your job at work, right? But in a spiritual sense, when we talk about our walk with God, a lack of information causes disruption in our soul. But in Psalm 119 it says that asking God for information, right? Asking God for his laws and his decrees actually gives the light. See, we often think that, quote unquote, more rules is restrictive, right? But actually, that's not true. But because if we have the understanding of what God wants from us, that actually gives us delight because we understand how we need to live our lives, and that creates order in our lives. You know, one of the biggest misconceptions with, with kids is they don't like boundaries or rules. Or structure. And well, being a parent of two, what I found is that if I don't give my kids structure, it frustrates them and it gives them chaos because they don't have a direction of what to do. And when we first had our first kid, we we, we did we, we, we first didn't have a structure, 
and realizing she was going all over the place. She wasn't going to bed on time. She wasn't doing anything she needed to do. And we realized we need to have structure because she needed to know what lane she needed to fall into. And the psalmist says, God, if you give me information, what I do, it's not going to hinder me. It's not going to frustrate me. God, give me information, teach me, because it gives me delight. You see, that changes your soul and your heart when you realize that God's information to you, His word to you, is a delight, is a joy, and not a hindrance. Number five, Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 8. Proverbs 3, verses 5 to 8. Can I get a volunteer to read, please? Dorothy. Trust the Lord with all your heart, and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge Him, and He will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. Verse 8. This will, yeah. you go <laughs> this will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. We went through this passage on week one, and here's what it talks to us about information. The transformation of information comes from God and not ourselves. God and not ourselves. Tim, how different life would be if you did all those things and just felt the person. Mm. How different life is. It would be very different. You know, it is so easy to get our information from the wrong place. Especially ourselves, right? Especially ourselves, because you know, uh, I think we all think in our own minds that we haven't, we have all the answers, right? It makes sense in our minds. It makes it makes sense to us, right? And sometimes what we do in our minds, sometimes most of the time, we lean on our own understanding, our own information, right? But what we need to do is trust in God's. Understanding not to be what the Bible says not to be wise in our own eyes because the reality is I don't have it all together. And, and, as as much experience as we have, as much education we have, here's the reality: God still has more to teach you. God still has more to teach all of us. You see, I never want to get to be a place in my life where I can't learn from God. Because as soon as we get to a place where we can't learn from God, then we stop relying on God. And He's no longer our God, our God is actually ourselves. So the truer transformation of information comes from God and not from ourselves. That, that's why until the day you go see Jesus, you have to be one that pursues God, pursues information, pursues what He has to say about us. And I love the end of this. It says it brings health to your body. And nourishment to your bones. You know there's a theme here? True information from God brings a sense of delight. It brings nourishment. It brings health to your body. There is a freeing aspect of life when we seek God, the true information, and what He wants for our lives. See, if I pull my information from somewhere else, myself or the world, it's not going to bring health to my body. It's going to bring unhealthiness, and it's not going to nourish my soul, it's going to hinder my soul. But if I can lean on God and not on me, then transformation of information will come from God, and He will what? Make my paths straight. Make my path straight. Don't you want God to make your path straight? Then the Bible says, don't be wise in your own eyes. Number six, Colossians chapter one verse nine to ten. Colossians chapter one verse nine to ten. Colossians 
Colossians chapter 1, verses 9 to 10. <coughs> Everybody, everybody's almost there. A few more people. We'll wait. Can I get a new volunteer to read this, please? Bob, go ahead. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work, and increasing in the knowledge of God. Uh, another good prayer, right? Um, on a side note, this isn't the point, but a side note is this. Um, it says that we constantly ask God to fill you with the knowledge, and the wisdom, and understanding. Uh, how often are you praying for people you know to be filled with more information? more knowledge, more understanding, right? I don't think I do that enough. Or I'm praying for people to be filled, right, with knowledge and wisdom and understanding from God. And I love how it says we have not stopped praying for you. It, 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 you know, prayer is a discipline. It's not a sprint. It's a marathon. It's a lifelong marathon. And it's something that we constantly do. Here's point number six, though. Point number six is this. The Holy Spirit gives the information to me to live a life that pleases God. Number six is this. The Holy Spirit gives us the information we need to live a life that pleases God. It says this. Our prayer is that through all the knowledge and the wisdom and the information that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, gives you. Why? Not just for ourselves, but why? So that, number verse 10, so that we can live a life Worthy of the Lord and pleasing to God, and that we can bear good work. So, the Holy Spirit is the one that can give us the information that we need, the knowledge, the wisdom to please God, to bear good work. Why? So that we could grow in the knowledge of God, so that we can grow in the information. Of God. The Holy Spirit will give us everything we need if we trust Him, but we want worthy of the gospel, worthy of God to bear good work in our lives. So that, not that we can grow in ourselves, so that we can grow in the knowledge of God. Number seven. Bible of Romans 10, verse 14 to 15. Romans 10, verse 14 to 15. <laughs> Romans 10, verse 14 to 15. Can I get a volunteer to read that, please? Yes, yeah, Lisa, come back. So we opened up with Jesus being our example of the ultimate person who gives information. That Jesus is the one who can proclaim freedom, to proclaim good news. So number seven is this, we are called to deliver people the good news, information, of the gospel. That's our call. <coughs> Think about that. How can they call on God if they haven't believed Him? And how can they believe God if they have not heard Him? You know, I wonder, I wonder how many people we interact on a daily basis, whether it be neighbors or co-workers, people who kind of bump into at the store or walk by on the street, people who are walking or jogging, or go at the gym. Curious, how many people have not heard because no one has ever told them? 
How many people live in a society not knowing Jesus loves them simply because they haven't heard? How many people have gone through life with struggles and, and, and depression and all the things that hinder them in life because they didn't know that there's an outlet in Jesus? How can they believe in the one of whom they have not heard? You know, I think it's easy to think that everybody's been exposed to church or something or some sort of history. But as we see sort of uh, society growing, like before, right, you can always, even if somebody didn't go to church, right, you can always talk to them and, and they even had a history of, oh, I went to church as a child, right? If, if you talk to an adult and maybe they weren't following Jesus or, or um, believing God or going to church, most of the time, right, things had a history of either going to church on Christmas or Easter or, or, or some more regularly. But the more and more our generation goes, as we move to a different generation, you can talk to people who literally have never stepped foot in a church growing up. I've talked to people, right, in this, in this generation who, who I, can, I ask them, did you ever go to church? And they had no experiences of what church or what Jesus is. We can't take for granted people know what church is. We can't take for granted people know what the Bible is, what Jesus is. And it says, right, how can anyone preach unless they, is, they are sent? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. You know, whether we understand it or not, or whether we realize it or not, in a, some form or some shape or some aspect, we're all missionaries. That we're all missionaries. We all have a mission field. Uh, I, I think it, the hindrance many Christians have is this. The hindrance that we have is uh, missionaries are ones who go across to the ocean, to the country, to tell people Jesus. And then people in our country are the ministers, the pastors, and we kind of sort of don't fall in any of those things. Okay? But when I read the Bible, it talks about being one to deliver the good news, to, to go out and, and <laughs> preach people of all nations. That is the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. What that tell me is, no matter where I am, I'm a missionary. Whether I'm in New York or I'm in Africa, no matter if I'm a businessman or actually a missionary, our job is to proclaim the good news of people around us. And how different our mindset would change if we understood that we are still called to deliver people the good news, the good information of the gospel. And what we say, and what we act, and everything we do. I think that radically would change our lives. That if we understand that the people who are called to give good news bring someone to Christ, aren't just the missionaries overseas, or the pastors, right? But it's, it's all of us. And also, the idea of missionaries has changed too, because more and more, people are sending missionaries to the United States now, right? Other countries are sending missionaries to the United States because people in this country need to hear the gospel. And the reality is, there are constant people who need to hear the good news. So before we go to the next point, my challenge to all of us is think about how does God want me to be the vessel of good news? See, it can be different for all of us, okay? For some of us, it can be just be a simple email or a note to someone we know or to a neighbor. For some of us, it could be literally just taking a Bible and, and, and going door to door on the street, right? For all, it's it, it, it different. God has us all in different spots for a reason. Right? Understand that. Understand that uh, where you are in life is not an accident. Right? The place where you live, right? the place where you um, work, that's all have a purpose. Let me, I'll share this story. Um, I think Dick and Jean were, were in my summer class, and I we talked about, um, uh, I moved into a new neighborhood last year. And uh, so, 
Gene in, in the class, because I, I, uh, I used to work in the, in the corporate world for five years, I came, came, to, I came to hear Grace officially on staff about a year ago, and at the same time I also moved to a new neighborhood, and then uh, Jean asked me this question, she goes, uh, do you ever uh, miss being around non-Christians? Because of my job, and, you know, because now I'm in the church, and I don't get to interact with, with uh, Christians very much, you know? Oh, no, I'm not Christians very much, I'm all basically here. I'm, pr I'm, pretty much, I'm pretty much on a Grace Fellowship premise six days a week, okay? I'm, I'm here uh, the majority of my, my week. So then she asked me that question, and that was a very good question that she posed to me. You don't mind, you don't mind me asking that. Okay. And then, so I said, yeah, no, I, I, I do mind, but I said, you know, the house that they were moved into a year ago, you know, something really crazy happened when we moved in. Uh, in our little uh, neighborhood, or surrounding houses, a stone throw uh, from my house. Literally, I, literally, I, take a, I, take a, I take a stone and throw it at a different house. There are about 12 kids or so, all within one or two years of each other. So we have this really giant neighborhood of kids and families of who, who actually uh, interact with each other. So we've been invited to birthday parties, to neighborhood barbecues, to various celebrations because of our kids. And our kids take the bus with these other families, we all go to all the same school. And it's really kind of interesting to see how God has put me here. We didn't know that there was a neighborhood. And they all are people who don't go to church. Okay? So, uh, Gene asked me this question in the summer. And what I did, I never told you. I, I never told you. I didn't see you. This is the last class. So, a week later, after after answering this question, do you, do, you, do, you, uh, do you miss being around non-Christians? And... We were we at the neighborhood um, uh, party. It was, I think, it was for the Fourth of July, right? And so we're so so we're sitting around. Uh, kids are playing, and it's kind of like this. We have this cul-de-sac, and one day we uh, bought like, picnic tables. So parents can hang on the picnic tables. Kids play. We had parties. We sat down, and guess what the topic came up about? Church. We didn't bring it up. Guess who brought it up? My neighbors did. So. They bring up this topic about, hey, um, uh, aren't you guys super religious or something? <laughs> okay. Alright, so wait, no, not, 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 not my ideal for how it start, right? So I said, okay. Uh, actually, and, I, and, and then my head and Melinda goes, my wife Melinda goes, well, he actually works for a church. See, when I moved in, I wasn't employed by the church, but now, uh, after I moved in, I, I was employed by the So they didn't really know that thing. They're like, oh, and they got really scared. And, and then one of my neighbors, saying, uh, the one next she goes, you know what, um, please don't judge me. And I'm like, why? She goes, why feel that? That uh, churches always judge me, I don't want to go to church, I feel judged, and I feel people judge me about my life. Perfect. Conversation with, with all the other parents, all the other parents, about that, you know, it's not a judgmental church. We talked about, uh, we live in East Greenbush, so that we, have a, we actually have a Greenbush campus about two miles from where our neighborhood is. We talked about how it's not judgmental. And then, you know, um, another family would say, well, you know, I would love to, but, you know, I have, I have you know, the, the time issue and that kind of thing. And I'm like, oh, no, you know, the services are in an hour. Talked about, we have Saturday services. And then I think we're talking about, you know, people just talking about, about, about misconceptions about church and Christianity. And we had this really ice-breaking, you know, um, conversation about church and how what we do and we believe. Okay? I wasn't say the end of the story is everybody got saved, but they didn't. But, <laughs> but, but you know what happened? We had an interesting conversation, an icebreaking question where they know, right, that they can come to us and have this open conversation anytime. And I didn't start this, okay? I, and I agree with the Holy Spirit, put this idea, right? Because when they start talking about church, my wife said, okay, that's right. Awesome. <laughs> so we, we started engaging it. And, you know, uh, we came home that night for the party, right? That's kind of, that was crazy how these conversations just happened, right? Why? Because God put you there for a reason. Uh, another, another story, quick story. We, uh, we, uh, a number of years ago, we went out to um, a cabin with another couple. A couple were friends of ours, both of them were unbelievers. It was a drive all the way about an hour and a half north of here. And we, and then the, um, the couple, that they weren't married, they were dating. And I was with the front seat with the guy, and, and the, my little, the one I was black seat with the girls. And we're just driving, we're just driving, and uh, and then the guy, the guy just looks at me and goes, 
Yeah, I don't really believe in God. Out of the blue! I didn't bring it up, right? And, 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 and I didn't provoke it, and I didn't. So he starts, and they start talking to me about his views on God. Why? I think the Holy Spirit puts us in places, right, for a reason. So I look at this verse, and we are called to deliver people the good news of the gospel. Where does God want you to bring good news? Number eight. Let's look at the book of Hosea. Hosea is in the Old Testament. Um, it's, in, it's where the prophets are. If you have a smartphone, you have an advantage. It's the Bible. Just find it. Hosea. <laughs> Take a right at Daniel. Hosea. <laughs> your daughters when they turn to prostitution, nor your daughters-in-law when they commit adultery, because the men themselves consort with harlots, and sacrifice with shrine prostitutes. A people without understanding will come to ruin. Wow. People, why people are destroyed by a lack of knowledge. So here's a, here's a, here's a point, number eight. A lack of information creates chaos. My people are destroyed from a lack of knowledge. And it says this. A people without understanding will come to ruin. Information is key to our growth, to our development, and to everything we do in life. A people without understanding will come to ruin. A lack of information creates chaos. We need to be people who are constantly pursuing information from God on what we need to do with our lives. If you were uh, here this weekend, I'm going to I'm going to quote um, our pastor, Pastor Rex, for something he said in the sermon this weekend. And uh, if you were here on Sunday with the video here, he was actually at uh, our Greenbush location preaching live out there. Uh, while preaching at Greenbush, and he said this there, and I don't know if he said it in the video as well, but he said this quote that I wrote down and I thought was kind of a cool thing to end on. Here's what he said, quoting Pastor Rex. In the sermon from last week, he said this, the information you have should really change you. He said this quote in the sermon. The information you have should really change you. And that really struck me as I was preparing to talk tonight about you about information. But he said that the information, yeah, he's right. The information you have, that should change us. That should transform us. And not only that, but how many people suffer from a lack of information? Jose said a lack of information right, creates chaos. It will give people ruin. Is it, is it change ongoing? Every five years, every ten years, every day. I mean, yeah. What's the point? Of saying, you know, I knew it every day. Yeah, yeah. But we kind of think, oh, I got enough of this. Yeah. I have what, five years. I've been doing this, and this is it. And right. now you've been doing this for thirty years. And you only got one change back at five. Yeah. What happened every minute, every hour, every day? Yeah. So we're not going to change because it's so much easier not to change. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, there's, there's a kind of static. Kind of thing. Yeah, and you know. We, we read scriptures and sometimes we see, you know, oh, you know, we read the Bible, we're like, oh, you know, Jesus walks in water, right? We kind of skim through it. Instead yeah. of, what, what, what new can I learn from this? I've read it 20 times, but you know what? God definitely wants to tell me something new on the 21st time. It's also understanding, hey, there are new things for me to learn, right? If, 
even if you've been coming here for 20 years, and you, you've heard 20 years of Pastor Rex's sermon, I guarantee you God still wants to talk to you through Rex's sermon, even though you've been here for years, because why? God wants to constantly change us to give information. Right? It, 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 it's the same way why we experience new things, we grow in new ways, because if we're constantly pursuing God and the information. Turn to page three, we're going to end this way. Here's what I want you to do. I want you to review the eight points in how we are transformed from information. And I want you to review the eight points. I want you to do two things. Write down which point really resonates with you. And write down which point you have struggled with the most. And then after that, I want you to write down your one takeaway for tonight's lesson. Alright?